Hey ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the channel. As always, it is Nick here, back to your daily crypto news and analysis. And today we are going to be talking about Ripple and XRP as well as the vast majority of crypto and finance. And today we have something very interesting to talk about, which is the internet of value. You already know about the internet of value uh, from the likes of Ripple and so many other companies as well within crypto that are focused on it. There's a lot of projects centered around it because this is going to be, you know, the next evolution, if you will, of the Internet, which is kind of right on par with Web3. Now, I will say um, I'm very excited about this tweet here from Brad Garlinghouse because it's right on par with what we've been hearing since, like, I want to say 2017, 2018. But now regulations are kind of making it a reality, and that is the MENA region. It seems as though Ripple is expanding rapidly into a lot of these areas. And uh here we have from Brad Garlinghouse himself. So he says, as I just shared on stage at Dubai FinTech Summit, Ripple is expanding in Dubai. With 20% of our customers based in MENA and clear regulatory regimes being developed, it's no surprise that Dubai is emerging as a key global financial hub for crypto innovation to thrive. And I really do think that these areas that are becoming global hubs for crypto, like the UK, the UAE, Hong Kong, etc., I love to see this because just like I said in my previous video, this is really accelerating the push on, or I shouldn't even say the push, but more so the pressure that's put on uh, the US to develop these, you know, crypto uh, regulatory frameworks as well as to adopt crypto. I do think that the US will essentially have no choice at some point in time here soon, um, but to adopt and accept crypto for what it really is. You know, frameworks, yes, they need to be created. Yes, we do need regulations. But for the most part, you know, a lot of these tokens, like even XRP, we already know what XRP is. It is a currency. You could transact an XRP all day long. You know, when we look at what's happening around, you know, this space, it's very, very interesting. And I do think that we should be focused on the movement of value as well, because obviously changing the way that value is created, moved and ultimately settled, that's a big deal. And Ripple has been focused on that for so long, and they've been successful in that as well. But nonetheless, let's dive in and let's start off with this. Uh, th this is a post on Ripple's website going back to 2021. I also have this post here from 2022. And uh, this is Ripple continues to build momentum in MENA with first on-demand liquidity deployment in the Middle East. As we do see their goal still to, you know, develop these use cases and expand within the MENA region, as you guys do see over here from this tweet from Brad Garlinghouse just today. Well, this tells me that they are going to focus heavily on these areas that are becoming, you know, overall global hubs for crypto. Um, we already know that Ripple is centered around the UK. We know that there is a lot of, uh, you know, Hong Kong talk and stuff like that. But for the most part, it seems like Ripple is on par with this. And as we do scroll down here, we do see with $78 billion in remittances in 2020 from Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, UAE, uh, combined, the Middle East and North America MENA region is home to two of the top three remittance corridors in the world. The region is also undergoing a fast moving shift to a digital and boast one of the world's most progressive financial regulatory environments. Today, Ripple announced its continuing con uh, contribution to this hotbed of fintech innovation with the first ever in-market on-demand liquidity deployment in the Middle East. And uh, yes, there was um, a lot of the connections here with people as well. The two will bring instant low-cost remittances to the area, starting with the UAE. And um, we do see them talking about XRP. Using on-demand liquidity and leveraging XRP, people will provide instant low-cost remittance options for people sending money into and out of the region. No XRP will not be held within the UAE, and transactions will not involve the currency AED as part of the payment flow. This is part of people's larger mission to enable digital payments for the 1 billion financially underserved smartphone users in the Middle East and Africa at large. And uh, yes, when we look at this, you know, I, I really do think that these are uh, these are the developments that we should be keeping a close eye out on. Like I said, this has been a big thing since going all the way back, you know, to 2021 and previously. And then just recently in 2022, we've seen Mina leapfrogging towards a digital currency future. And as we do scroll down, we can actually look into this. So as the world increasingly uh, trends towards green energy solutions and profits from oil exports decline, many MENA countries are looking to diversify their economies away from fossil fuels. Numerous countries have looked to fintech to bolster development from an industry standpoint and to drive greater fi uh, financial access for their uh, populations. Now, 
a lot of this is centered obviously on CBDCs as you guys do see um, but then we also do look at a few things down here so they are still discussing this idea of CBDCs within a lot of these regions but they also do uh, look to separate themselves from the SWIFT platform and utilize something different as a payment network now we've talked about that possibly around RippleNet being like the new SWIFT um, it's questionable on if that's going to be the case. I don't really look at it as that. I look at it more so as, um, you know, CBDCs will be issued out on DLT technology. And then what we will have is a, a bridge currency at the center point. And the reason why I think that this is the most logical case is because, you know, Swift as a platform is already kind of dying. I think that a lot of these overseas nations are moving away from Swift because they don't want to be underpinned by the US dollar, which has been a big deal. We've talked about that with de-dollarization. Um, as we look at the CBDC idea, I know everyone hates it. Trust me, I don't like it as well. I, I, I've always been kind of, I've been always pushing away from CBDCs just because I don't see them as a great opportunity for the retail sector, more so as a great opportunity for the central banks to actually just control digital currencies themselves. But when we look at CBDCs, if we have just the the central bank themselves have their own currency, so that would be a wholesale CBDC. Um, that would be beneficial because it will decentralize the entire financial system. That would be very good, and ultimately it will pick up a lot of traction from a lot of overseas nations that want to get away from the U.S. dollar and also away from the reserve currency. There will never be a reserve currency if we have CBDCs within their own jurisdictions. But also, as we do look at the internet of value, this has been the big deal for me ever since going all the way back to 2017. We do see the internet of value, what it means and how it benefits everyone. And uh, as we do scroll down here, we do see what is the Internet of Value. So our vision is for value to be exchanged as quickly as information. Although information moves around the world instantly, a single payment from one country to another is slow, expensive and unreliable. In the US, a typical international payment takes about three to five days to settle, has an error rate of at least 5% and an average cost of $42 worldwide. There are $180 trillion worth of cross-border payments made every year. This is now, um, I think this is actually even more now, um, with a combined cost of more than $1.7 trillion per year. And this was back in 2017, mind you. With the internet of value, a value transaction such as a foreign currency payment can happen instantly, just as how people have been sharing words, images, and videos online for decades. And it's not just money. The Internet of Value will enable the exchange of any asset that is of value to someone, including stocks, votes, frequent flyer points, securities, intellectual property, music, scientific uh, discoveries, and more. Now, all of this is crucial to note because guess what? This is be becoming a reality through tokenization. Digitization will flood into every single major industry and every single major sector. This will be the Internet of Value. And the crazy thing is, is that this will also lead to, and I know a lot of people will, you know, they'll turn a blind eye to this, but this will lead to the greatest wealth transfer in history. Why do I believe so? Well, everything of value will be tokenized on the blockchain. That means everything that has at least any sort of value tied to it will flow onto the blockchain in an instant. With that in mind, that will flow so much liquidity, so much value, so much volume this will be the greatest wealth transfer and it's going to be very exciting to watch but also we are already changing the way that value is moved we moved 50 million dollars in xrp in like two seconds and it cost 30 cents it is amazing michael errington summit soul uh 2018 listen closely to this like yeah people the tribalism in this industry is insane. So there, there's Bitcoin maximalists, there's every, but everybody agrees like, you know, XRP sucks and, and I, I, actually, I don't really get it, right? I mean, it's, they're a legitimate company, they don't pretend to be something they're not and they're really good at one thing, moving money fast and cheap. And um, it's fantastic, it fills a big need. And for a hedge fund like us to be able to denominate in Ripple and XRP, I just did the same thing, uh, <laughs> is, is really, really, really good. We did our first close. Uh, we moved north of four, $50 million into the company in Ripple, in XRP, in like two seconds, and it cost 30 cents. Now, that is amazing. The only, there's no way to do that with fiat or Bitcoin 
there's just no way to do it that fast and that cheaply. And, and so it serves a really useful uh, need for us. And, and then also when, when our LPs eventually redeem, hopefully never, but when they want some of the money back, we, we just send it in XRP again. And there's no three day wait for international wires or one day wait for US wires. We're not paying wire fees and all that. It's just, I don't understand why that's hard to understand. And so the religious wars aside, the tribalism aside, it does some things really well. And we love it for that. That being said, just because we're denominated in XRP, I'm not a special pleader for XRP. I don't work for them. The company itself is not our LP. Other people who had XRP are. I like them, I think they're great, but they're like less than 5% of our asset base at this point. Like we do invest in XRP, but most of our investments are in other things. So there you have it. I mean, like when you move value that quick and that cheaply, like even though he's not like a big advocate for XRP or anything like that, you know, it's impossible to ignore the the actual facts around this. I mean, we are literally changing the way that value is moved and settled and the costs associated with it. It's incredible. And also over here, we do see we believe that the value that value should move as seamlessly as information. This is just a recent post, May 7th. Listen to uh, Chris Larson here. My name is Chris Larson. I am one of the co-founders uh, and currently the executive chairman of Ripple. Uh, since our earliest days, we really saw this as the building of what we, we would refer to as an internet of value, where uh, value money um, is moving uh, like data does today on you know the internet of data as we know it. And we think that's profoundly important because uh, when you look at today's world, um, I, I think we see it as like globalization is not complete until you have uh, kind of three things that are working together, that you have a really efficient and interoperable uh, shipping in uh, infrastructure. And we have that with this uh, beautiful invention called the shipping container. We've had that since the 50s where, you know, every port, train, truck, uh, factory is interoperable with any other port, train, truck anywhere in the world. Um, that's a good thing and has made shipping incredibly efficient and accessible. Second, you need uh, data to be moving uh, globally, uh, interoperably, uh, essentially uh, for free with access to everyone. That's what Internet Protocol did in you know, starting in the 80s and into the 90s, fundamentally changing the way we communicate. But that's not enough. We also need to have money and value moving in that same way where every uh, money network is interoperable with every other money or value uh, network anywhere on the planet, um, where everybody has equal access to that internet of value, uh, where costs are uh, as low as they can possibly be um, so that everybody can participate um, in that globalized economy. So we think with those three things that are in place, you truly have uh, globalization that works for everybody. And that's why we're so passionate about working uh, on this notion of an internet of value. That's fundamentally what we're doing here. Uh, and I think over the last 10 years, we've made great progress to that. And we're really excited about uh, what comes next in terms of what that's going to mean for the average person. And also what that's going to mean for enterprises anywhere in the, in the world to make what they do uh, less expensive, faster, more able to respond to their customers uh, so that everybody has um, uh, an equal shot at participating in the global economy. And what he's saying here, I mean, like changing the way everything is going to work. It, 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 I mean, this is literally changing payment networks, global payment networks. I don't think a lot of people understand just how big of a deal this actually is. When you when you're changing things, I love how he he talked about internet protocols, right? Not a lot of people understand how internet protocols even work. You know, they load up their their Google Chrome or whatever browser they're using. They search something, it loads. They all think that oh, it's whatever. They don't think on how any of that works. When you go and make a payment, and all of a sudden it settles instantly, and maybe the payment was worth a million dollars. Who knows? right and you paid a fraction of a penny you're not going to question on you know what's making that work you're not going to question what technology is behind that 
to me, that's that's the goal of all of this, right? That's why when I read articles like this, where here's how the internet of value can trigger mass market adoption for blockchain, like I don't think that people are going to realize what is happening. I don't think that people will realize how things are working. That's why when I talk to all of you and I'm like, you know, you guys that understand this, you guys that are behind this technology that, you know, see what's happening, you know, you are ahead of like 99% of the general public. Like a lot of people don't understand how any of this works. I mean, try to explain blockchain technology to somebody. And again, they, they just don't get it. They don't understand it. That's why like when we talk about CBDCs on this channel, like I even say, you know, th there is some scary stuff around these CBDCs. But if you have companies like Ripple that are centered out on uh, creating privacy technology around CBDCs and security measures and things like that, you know, all those scary thoughts around CBDCs could ultimately be counteracted if you have good players assigned to it. Um, but also trying to relay the fact that like what a CBDC actually is to the general public, they don't understand it. They don't get it. It confuses them. And, you know, it's definitely the same thing, like I said, like around, you know, blockchain technology, around what's happening around the Internet of value. Nobody understands it. That's why being ahead of that, that entire amount of individuals, you know, understanding this technology, understanding what it is and how it's changing things. That's a huge step for you because it is going to allow you to be a part of the, you know, greatest wealth transfer in history. And a lot of people think that's going to happen overnight, but it's not. It's going to happen over time, but it's going to happen very fast when it does and when you see over here from mr man xrp this is chris larson again the internet of value is going to be so different than the first internet blockchain has become popular with the policymakers. we have a stream of them uh coming through our office that's a very different uh now than it was two years ago since the libertarian bitcoin movement and uh listen closely to this yeah so uh great question so uh you know again the internet of value is going to be so different from the first internet because you're going to have three uh, really different domains have to work, work together, right? Tech, capital, and compliance. And compliance just has a, an outsized uh, you know, influence when it comes to money, for obvious reasons. It's not gonna change, it's just the reality. We sort of need to sort of stop fighting that and just say that's just the way it is. But I think there's a lot of good news there. Throughout the world, FinTech generally, and blockchain specifically, has become you know, kind of very, very popular in, in the, you know, po with policymakers. So we have a stream of policymakers coming from all over the world, coming through our offices. Uh, so that's a very good dynamic. That's very different from two years ago. Uh, two years ago with the Mt. Gox collapse uh, and some of the nonsense being spewed out by sort of these you know, libertarian Bitcoin fanatics, which was just not helpful at all. Uh, and thankfully, they've really come, uh, Bitcoin community has done a great job of really adjusting. They've got lobbyists all over the world. They're well-funded, much better. Um, but you know you you have to take it seriously you've got to get good compliance people involved in your startups really early i know it's a pain it's expensive but you just got to do it um i'd say get some connections to policymakers. don't spend too much time in washington it could be a real sinkhole so you can get in that trap as well where you're you know having a lot of meetings and meanwhile your competitors are getting ahead of you because you're spending too much time in washington but yeah, I mean, he's right. Like this will be so different than the first internet. We are literally changing. We are fundamentally changing the way, you know, things are, are, are working. Things are, you know, settle. I mean, like this is just, it's on par with the exact image of the original internet, you know, changing the way that we can communicate, changing the way that things are, you know, processed. This is changing value movement. And when we look at the Internet of Value, I mean, I don't like the idea of like comparing XRP to Bitcoin. I don't like the idea of comparing, you know, a crypto to a crypto. I don't think that we should get stuck in that idea. Um, but as we do look at the Internet of Value and as we do look at XRP, you know, XRP has a ton of use case potential. Um, even within the XRP ledger, I've talked about the XRP ledger, how the XRP ledger is extremely valuable. You know, as we do look at everything happening around um xrp like these are the use cases like we're centered out on b2b payments bridge currency standards store of value medium of exchange sourcing global liquidity smart contracts micropayments instant cross-border settlement you know all of this stuff tied back to one currency like this is much different than your typical you know cryptocurrency i know a lot of people get stuck in the idea of comparing the price action of xrp looking at what the price is you know today tomorrow next week but you know to me you know i look at xrp and if it's under 50 cents or if it's even under a dollar you know, I'm going to buy some. 
you know maybe I, I i won't buy you know a heavy stack you know when the price is pumping or anything like that but you know during this last i want to say couple months even going all the way back to the summertime of uh of 2022 like we had such a long time to accumulate so much xrp and i i look at it as such an incredible opportunity you know technically speaking i even look at you know i even look at um the the lawsuit the sec lawsuit and i'm like wow this is actually an incredible opportunity for us because it allowed us for for you know those that really wanted to get a heavy bag of xrp it allowed you to get that bag of xrp that you wanted you know 17 to 20 cents that's a huge area to buy XRP at. And then it went to two dollars. You know, ten X. It was a huge move. And now, more than ever, we look at XRP. We look at what's happening. We look at the focus point of them, and then we look at what's actually happening around cryptocurrencies and the Internet of Value. Like here, you have from uh, Davos 2023 with the World Economic Forum, why we still need cryptocurrency for an Internet of Value. Like this is, this is the fundamental piece to all of it. We do see cryptocurrency and blockchain are revolutionizing the exchange of value as the internet did for the exchange of information. However, the need for industry reform is clear. Cryptocurrencies use case vary worldwide with more uses possible with emerging Web3 technologies. The future of crypto markets can't be discussed without addressing the collapse of the crypto exchange uh, FTX, whose failure was defined by broader organizational and economic considerations. But again, as we do look at you know the internet of value, it's clear to me that the use case potential here is so vast and the value derived from it is also extremely vast. We do see like it has the potential to unlock new use cases in finance that aren't usually uh, or currently possible due to the illiquidity of traditional assets, increase transparency and foster more direct relationships between sellers and customers, bring decentralization to the business world by enabling community ownership as well. Like this is it, it truly is a big moment for us because you know, as we look at this, I mean, it's it's crazy to think about, but so many people don't understand what's actually happening here. But though, like the XRP community, although a lot of people want to make fun of the XRP community and, you know, joke around and whatever. It's clear. We know what's happening. We understand what's happening. When you change things like this, when you make illiquid asset classes liquid, when you're changing the value, when you are, you know, changing the way that value is exchanged, settled, whatever. That's a huge deal. And it's extremely valuable. So with that being said, I hope that you guys enjoyed this video. If you guys did, definitely leave a like, subscribe to notifications on because I'm a free content. If you guys are more than welcome to follow me over on Twitter and join the free Discord down in the description below. Uh, this is up to you all. Have a beautiful day or a beautiful night wherever you guys are in this beautiful world. This has been Nick. Peace out, guys.